A high speed wreck on a fabled American racetrack is where this particular GT3 met its end. But the story isn't quite complete yet. And for those that are thinking and undoubtedly commenting that this thing looks fixable, well, that's because I've only shown you the good side. This chassis, it's completely toast. But the question remains, how deep does the damage go? We aren't gonna get that answer with it just sitting on the trailer. We've also got a bed full of parts that this GT3 race car came with. I think it's time to see exactly what we've got. The damage on this car is just absolutely insane. I think the further that we get into this, the more apparent it's gonna become just how crazy of a high speed wreck this was. So serious that they had to cut the cage door bar to get the driver out of the car. Now the person that we picked this car up from was the driver of the vehicle. This accident happened a couple years ago and the car has just been sitting. He basically walked away from it. The extent of his injuries were something like some broken ribs and a lot of bumps and bruises, which given the nature of this accident is probably very, very lucky. He wasn't too keen to talk about it, but the information that he did give us is that this thing had some sort of suspension failure at the top of the pack straightaway on Virginia International raceway something happened with the alignment on it and a sudden change at massively high speed sent this thing careening out of control and he ended up into a tire barrier and this is the result now we know we're not going to get a lot out of the body on this car but the depth of the damage is primarily concerning with the motor like most salvage stories the condition of the drive line is going to determine how successful financially this endeavor is a salvage story is where we go through the dollars and cents behind a salvage operation here like Lee C Parts and talk about the costs associated with salvage auction vehicles. When we bought this car, we were aware that there is some damage to the motor. There's some minor stuff like this pulley here, but also more serious, some of the mounting bosses on the block itself have some damage. So what we wanna do first is try and fire this thing up and hear it run before we start this dismantle process. We have the fuel pump unhooked. We want to let this thing prime with oil first before we attempt to actually fire it up. Go ahead. All right, stop. That sounds a little bit worse than these motors normally do. Now, with this dropout, we still have plenty of work to do. There are tons of parts that still need to be separated off of this. And then we need to dive into this motor and figure out what was making that absolutely awful noise when we attempted to fire it up. The chassis, though, 
Amazingly, it is already finished this early in the video. I did go through and grab a couple other pieces like the fuel pump assembly, and then here in the interior, what we needed to grab out of it was pretty sparse. We went ahead and grabbed the gauge cluster and then the cluster hood cover, a couple modules and some pigtails from the wiring harness in the rear, and that is really all. Now, somebody along the way did leave us a note on here. I owe you $6 for BBS. So so gonna have to dive into that. It's really not gonna take too much detective work to figure out which one of the other two idiots that loves Porsches here in the shop went ahead and left us that little note. Normally when we go to the scrap yard, the chassis end up looking like this. <laughs> But for the first time, we have a chassis here that has a roll cage in it that is specifically designed to prevent the roof from caving in like that. Well, that was a whole lot of fun and very impressive at the same time. It's obvious to see that that roll cage was built very, very well. If you were in a rollover type of situation with that car, I think that you would have had a very, very good chance at walking away with as low of injuries as possible. So it's very cool to see safety equipment like that cage doing its job against a giant, massive hydraulic crane. Now, Time to get back to the shop. We need to tear down that drive line and see exactly where our issue is in that motor. This gives us a much better image of the extent of this damage. Now this piece here is the coolant crossover between the heads and then it has the mount points there. You can see this one is essentially completely just broken away from the block free spinning that is not supposed to come out just like that it's supposed to thread in this one is wedged in there now if this was the only damage that we had here and we didn't hear that knocking sound coming from the inside of the motor then we would probably leak this down and leave it together as is because this is not that uncommon for these motors it is possible to have damage like this and have it repaired
And now with the intake manifold off, we can see some reliability mods that you would expect to see on a motor like this. One of the big issues with a lot of these Porsches is that these water fittings from the factory are press in. And I guess just a lot of heat cycles on the motor over time, they are known to come loose and leak. You can see that all of these are welded, which is much, much more reliable. And that is as expected to see on a motor with this type of use on it. Now, it also looks like we had some sort of friend that was living in this at some point in time. I don't see any evidence on the wiring harness that shows any damage. I do think that we are pretty close to being ready to have to separate the motor from the transmission. The absolute first thing that I want to do is go ahead and leak down test this motor. I think that that might give us an indication of some of the issues that we have going on internally. But I also tore more off the top of this motor. I don't see any additional damage. Now, this is the water pump assembly that goes on the front of the motor. And then this is the crossover onto the bottom of the motor for the heads. And unfortunately, this thing is not salvageable. I imagine this water pump comes off, but doesn't exactly sound great and unfortunately this entire piece is trash because of the damage that it sustained so rather unfortunate that some of those reinforced water outlets and reliability mods are just going straight into the dumpster well i was going to try the double nut approach to remove that stud and it started coming out on its own feeling a little bit better about this motor because we have slightly less damage than I originally thought. We only have one boss that is damaged. This one you could put a new stud or a new bolt into and you would be just in fine shape. Plugs don't look too bad. Visually, aside from the little bit of grass and hay that is from whatever Virginia field this thing ran off into, everything looks to be pretty good on both sides of the motor now that we have both of them opened up. That clunking that we heard when the motor was cranking automatically makes me think that this thing has like a bottom end issue, a rod bearing, something along those lines, but I see no signs that any amount of metal has gone through this motor. The oil looks great. I don't see any scoring, any gouges on it. So. We're still not finding anything super negative, but this leak down test might give us a couple answers. Cylinder number one looks to be pretty darn strong. It's about, it's a little low on the pressure, but we'll call that like an eight. I do hear a little bit of blow by in the crankcase there though, which might not be overly surprising given that this is a like a race car built motor. Another really strong number at a five, but I'm still hearing some blow by in the crankcase. And that's fine if it's getting good numbers on it, but it'd be interesting to see if we get a, a higher leak down number if that increases. And there's kind of what I was expecting to see, not necessarily because of that little bottom end clunking, but because of what I'm hearing here with some blow by. Don't feel anything coming out of the intake side. Maybe a little bit from the exhaust side. Definitely louder with the blow by on this one though. Pretty good leak down numbers here, except for that cylinder in the middle over here on what is the driver's side of the motor if it were still mounted in the car. I think that what we're probably gonna end up finding is some sort of issue on the top end of the bottom end, the uh, basically with the piston. Maybe a ringland issue, maybe a little bit of cylinder scoring, but I think that's gonna be where our noise was coming from. Now, up until this point, I haven't regretted being the one to tear down this car, but that all might be about to change.
The cylinder in question is that middle one, and unfortunately, it's pretty high up in its stroke. The head is still on the other side, so we definitely cannot spin this motor over. But I'm a little bit surprised. I was expecting to just see something that was going to be a little bit glaring just right when we pop the head off. The head itself looks fine as well. Again, nothing really jumping out at me. Kind of really the only thing I notice is there's two, two little like kind of just extra clean spots on that cylinder right there around the valve that these don't have which is maybe slightly curious and then also looking at it there's some sort of buildup like right there in the middle while in theory i understand this process definitely never done it before so this might be interesting I'm definitely understanding a lot more what we have heard in the past from shops like Aim Performance on Lee's 997 rebuild. What he did was pistons and rods, but they didn't have to split the case. And we still haven't split the case yet. I guess what we just took off would be considered the sleeves, maybe the upper part of the combustion chamber. I guess really the entire part of the combustion chamber, but it is removable on these Porsche motors. And this center cylinder cylinder where we were kind of expecting to see maybe something that would indicate why we were getting some blow by I still don't see anything It's definitely pretty wild seeing this thing completely broken apart like this. The only thing that I'm noticing as far as abnormal wear is this most rear journal for the crank itself. Both top and bottom seems to have a lot more wear to it and nothing like giant gouges or anything like that, but you can definitely see that there is some excessive wear. The crank itself though, luckily looks completely fine i don't see anything really you know giant jumping out on the crank itself but those bearings definitely look a little bit worn and not that i wanted to see just something absolutely catastrophic but it would have been nice to get a definitive answer but i'm still glad that we went this route it's a lot of time to tear this down but at the same time advertising a motor a very expensive motor and saying it has some sort of internal issue is really opening up the door for a lengthy lengthy sales process there's very few people that are going to want to just kind of take that plunge blindly so we put the time into tearing this thing down we know exactly what we can sell and we know the condition of it so even though it's in pieces it should sell a whole lot quicker since we know exactly what we're selling So what do you think? Do you hate Porsches just as much as I do now? I hate more 996s at this point. Is this the worst car you've ever photoed? Uh, it's one of my top three. Top yeah, three yeah. worst cars. Definitely, yeah. I don't like race cars. So if you sell another project to us, please organize your stuff. You heard Fernando, if you wreck your race car, don't even think about hitting up Lee Parts until you've gone through, inventoried everything, organized it for us to make our jobs easier. It's time for the parts breakdown. We've been giving you a little bit different look for these parts breakdowns. Lee and Fernando were in the demon on the last one. And for this one, all the Porsches around the shop have windshields. So this would be difficult. And I personally don't want to spend 
any more time in one of them than I already have tearing down this particular GT3. So I've been using this as my setup on my side channel for what I call salvage auction analysis. We've been going through specific vehicles that have been running across the auction block diving into them a little bit further. So if that's something that sounds interesting to you, head on over to my side channel, Scrap Life Dolt, to check that out. But as far as this particular GT3 race car, the numbers are in. It took a little while for Alex to get everything listed, and rightfully so, because this thing produced 136 parts, an absolutely massive number considering how little we took out of it. Now, most, most of that is because we did tear down the motor, a lot of individual pieces that we're gonna go over here in a minute, but the total parts value is the number that we are most interested in. $65,167 from those 136 parts. And I haven't told you yet what we paid for this car. I will in just a minute, but that is a absolutely massive number for what we paid for this car. Let's take a look at the parts first though. First up, we have the transmission, and this is a, from what we could tell, a 997 GT3 transmission. Alex was doing a lot of digging, a lot of research on it. We were reaching out to some of our resources that you've seen on the channel here in the past, and uh, best we can tell, this is a 997 GT3 trans, which adds some value to it. And then number two in the parts value is the cylinder heads. These things are just absolutely massive value. You can see that that is for just one of the cylinder heads. $3,000 for one side of the motor, $6,000 for both of them combined. Now we have two sets of coilover suspensions. The JRZs were on the car when we picked it up and then the Motons were separate. So really that's kind of where this being a race car just came into play that there were a lot of parts. You see the GT3 crankshaft here, $3,000 for that. The other cylinder head, you have the case halves, one of which was damaged, we noted that, but you have 2,000 bucks per case half. I'm very, very curious ultimately what happens with those and how long they take to sell. And that's gonna be something that we're gonna touch on very, very significantly is the dead inventory number, which is items that we have to discount significantly in order to sell or items that don't sell at all. It's entirely possible that damaged case half might fall into that category. As we continue scrolling, we have the CCWs, which is $1,800. They came out to be very, very straight. They were not on the car at the time of the wreck and neither was the other set of wheels that I did get to the bottom of who left us that $6 IOU and I'll just say justice was served. Just hit the wall for powder coating, right? No. No, you thought those cinder blocks were just for, you know, thumbnails, huh? Have fun putting your wheels on in the rain. As we continue scrolling, we still have several high dollar items. The pistons, the carbon ceramics, which again, were not on the car because this thing was heavy track use. It was converted to steel brakes. So these carbon ceramics were in pretty darn good shape and the price reflects that. You have $1,500 a piece for both of the rears and then $1,300 a piece for both of the fronts with that intake manifold mixed in there. $1,300 for that, which is just absolutely crazy. I am gonna click on this. Let's see the configuration for how we have it listed. So this is the complete upper manifold and just the upper manifold. So that means that we're going to have the lower manifold sections with the fuel rail that's gonna be listed separately. We'll get to that here in a little bit. As we continue scrolling, really one of the big ticket items from the interior is that gauge cluster. $1,300 for the GT3 gauge cluster, more engine related items, dry sump oiling, Rear seat to lead $1,000 with the GT3 logo. I don't have any personal experience on that, but I have to imagine that that might be kind of a, 
a, a high desire item. Um, I just feel like these GT3s, there's not that many of them. And there's a lot of people that want to convert street cars to kind of more track car type feel. So I could see that selling pretty quickly for somebody that wants to bolt on a roll bar, kind of like Lee put into his 997. The engine wiring, we have the rotors themselves. These are the two piece steel rotors, more engine related stuff. I think that's going to be everything I want to highlight for the parts. As we continue scrolling, you get into just some more run-of-the-mill type parts. And ultimately, that helps to add up to the profit that we're going to see out of this car. But from a video standpoint, it just kind of gets boring real quickly. The only other thing I do want to highlight is that we did already sell a couple parts from this car. The big items being that driver front headlight. It was one of the projector headlights, so it came with good value, $800 for the headlight, which kind of surprised us. We didn't realize that it was that expensive. And then also the carbon ceramic brake calipers. That is going to do it for everything that I wanted to touch on parts-wise. Now it's time to actually break this thing down. So we have a parts total of $65,167. We'll go ahead and add in the $2,800 for those parts that sold that I just highlighted, which brings us to a grand total of $67,967. Now, the first thing that we're gonna take off is going to be the purchase price of the car, which was $14,000 for a wrecked GT3 race car. Again, this was a private party deal. Private party stuff can be interesting as far as pricing goes because depending on how it's been advertised, if it's put on you know, a public market, things along those lines, it can be different than these items that run through salvage auction where you kind of just get a standardized pricing because there's so many people that get to look at them. This, I think, was an absolutely phenomenal deal and the numbers are going to prove that. Next up, this was a local car to us right on the other side of Baltimore. So all we have to do is subtract $100 for shipping. And that was just gas to get up there in the evening to pick the car up. Next off is going to be our selling fees, which we always do a standard 10%. That accounts for credit card processing fees, eBay fees, anything associated with us selling the item to our customer. Next up, the labor charge. This was $1,000. This thing was pretty in-depth with the motor teardown. I had a lot of time into this. Fernando had a lot of time photoing it. Alex had a lot of time listing it. From the shipping side, the, the part shipping I put down for $5,000. And that's a pretty high number. And I wanted to shoot a little bit high on this just to give us uh, a little bit of a, a realistic look at this car. There's not a ton of freight items. I don't think that Air is going to have a ton of time shipping any one individual item. But 136 parts, that's just a lot of time and a lot of potential cost in shipments if they're going out to the West Coast, for example. If I ship every single $136 part out to the West Coast, that's a lot of individual shipments and that costs add up. So I think $5,000 should do the trick on the parts shipping side. And then the last one, and I'm gonna put the phone down for this, our dead inventory number. I talked about it earlier. That is the number for parts that either do not sell or we have to discount heavily to sell. This particular car, it, it produced a lot of parts that I think are going to take a very, very long time to sell. In previous salvage stories for the R8s, both the GT and just the normal V10 that we did, I did 20 to 25% dead inventory, which is the highest we've ever done. This car, it's setting a new record. We are doing 35% of our parts total for dead inventory, which is $22,808. And I think that that is gonna be an accurate number, even though Carrington couldn't be here for this. I talked with him about it because I wanted to give this a realistic representation. And he agreed that he thought that that was a good number. It's possible it might be a little bit higher, but that brings us to our theoretical net margin of $18,000. $542, which is a absolutely fantastic number. Now we're going to head over to the board and we're going to see how it compares to everything else that we have there.
And here we have the big board. Even though this is a big number of car, it doesn't belong in the big baller division for a purchase price of $30,000. And you can see just where this thing would stack up here in the high score, number one overall. But I'm not going to put it here. I'm going to put it right over here in the little baller division with this extremely handsome man there. And now I'm gonna to explain to you why. The majority of our vehicles here are salvage auction vehicles. There's only one other private party car on that entire board, and it was one of the early cars when we started doing the salvage stories. This thing was an exceptional deal, but I think it was also an outlier. I don't think that it's really fair to put it up on the board, given just how unique of a purchase it was, and also because that dead inventory number is very much up in the air. We put a monster number at 35% of our parts total, but I, we don't even know if that's 100% accurate. Some of these higher end cars, the parts can sit for a very, very, very long time. So for those reasons, I think I'm gonna go ahead, just leave it off to the side there. That way the salvage story high score list is really as accurate as it possibly can be. And these other vehicles that we buy at salvage auction, we have the best chance to represent them as accurately as possible. Completely unrelated is my personal vendetta against Porsches. I would never let that affect the accuracy of the high score list on the salvage stories here, but I can honestly say that I wouldn't want to try to beat that Porsche and to see it as number one for a long, long time would just, you know, not sit well with me. So I think it's best to put it where we put it for the reasons that I outlined earlier, not the last one that I just said. Now, I'm sure Carrington will love to see the numbers on that. He is knee deep getting a certain Mopar ready for PRI out in Indianapolis. We are gonna be there this upcoming weekend. And if you're in the area, come by and say hi. We always love meeting as many of the viewers in person as we possibly can. So if you're around, pop in, say hi. The demon will be in Mantix clutches booth and then we'll be walking around checking out the show just like everybody else too so we have tons of stuff coming up this winter plenty of projects i have some that have been back burner that i need to get finished carrington has that big one that he needs to finally get running and then he's also starting a couple others that i think you guys are really really going to like and then also there's plenty of fun content on the side channels i have been doing a lot more with mine doing the salvage auction breakdowns as well as some of the other just shorter form videos and then carrington posts a lot of reels on his so if you're into what we do around here make sure that you're subscribed to all of the scrap life channels and one way or another we will see you in the next video